I was looking at ones where the neighbours are right, you know, like touching the house, like it's like a terraced house or something like that. Um, and that would have been really sort of tricky to do. And I was showing pictures of these houses to my family and friends and they were going like, oh, you know, Sam, you really can't like doodle a house. You really shouldn't, shouldn't do it because people are going to get like, uh, they're going to complain about it and stuff, you know. So I had to find one that was like situated in its sort of own sitting where no one could really get too mm. annoyed with how it looked and stuff. This is, this is um, what they call a high-class problem. <laughs> it's got to be a mansion. I just know it. <laughs> Let's call the investors in now. You need the Kellervision app. 24-7 mini documentaries, podcasts, live shows, DJ live streams, top five, subscription packages, plus products for all your podcasts and street culture sports. Download it from the app store for free today. Instagram UK Frontline. Beatbox created. And we need to talk about world music and street culture. Killer Keller podcast. Well, here we go. Ladies and gentlemen, Killer Keller podcast. Live and direct. Not in central London at all. All will be revealed in a second. Um, big shout out to our sponsors, Hoddle Warriors crew over at the Crypto Moon Boys Hideout. That's some NFT business for you. It's if you've got the Television app, you're in the right place. Home of all the street culture activities you'll ever need. Free download iPhone, Android for your street culture sports. Inside his house, we have a very special podcast. A friend of mine that goes back four years in the first time that he came round to my humble abode and uh, thought we'd return the favour. Stepping in to the labyrinth, the Alice in Wonderland, Charlie and the Chocolate Factory mind, I can only describe it as one hell of an immersive experience. He promised it, he delivered it, the world of Mr. Doodle inside the <laughs> Thank you very much. How are you, dude? Yeah, really well, thanks. Yeah, doing well. I'm feeling yeah. good. I'm yeah. feeling pretty happy. If you're listening and not watching right now, Killer Kells has pretty much been plonked into the universe that is Mr. Doodle. And surrounding us right now, and I cannot emphasize this any more strongly, is every single doodle imaginable? <laughs> what were you thinking? <laughs> <laughs> well, um, I mean, it's been my dream to to doodle a whole house since I was about fifteen. I mean, when I was fifteen, I, I covered my bedroom with drawings. Um, my mum and dad let me draw over my walls and stuff, and I did that. And I went to sleep and woke up every day in that room, and I just loved being in a room full of my doodles mm. and. Uh, I just wanted to get bigger and, you know, grow that vision more and, and live in a bigger environment like that. So I've always dreamed, dreamt since, since then about doing it to a whole house. And, um, yeah, and sort of when we last spoke, I was still dreaming about it. <laughs> yeah, you were. <laughs> and, uh, and, and, yeah, about three years ago, I managed to, to buy this place and then over that sort of time, been turning it into doodles. Well, you said on the first, but you can go and check out the first podcast, ladies and gentlemen. Of course you can. It's up there with all the greats on a Killer Keller podcast. Uh, you definitely emphasised, uh, and I, I, I'll be paraphrasing if I word for worded it, but you most certainly made it clear to the universe your intention was to take over the world one doodle at a time, <laughs> starting with the place you live. How does that feel to be in here right now with your dream becoming a reality? Well, it's really um, like a hugely important thing to me to have finished this project. It's something I've been thinking about for so long and it's always been the, the thing at the front of my mind for such a long time. Um, and it feels, I feel really proud to have, to have done it, but I also feel like I can really um, achieve a, a lot more now. I feel like the potential for what I can do is... Um, been sort of opened up and, mm. and, and I feel like I can do a lot of things that I hadn't really thought of before so as soon as I finished this I started thinking about next possible things how do I continue the story like now that Mr Doodles doodled a house what does he doodle next and how does it get bigger where does it go from here and um, so I'm just really excited about the future because this project's allowed me to see what I'm capable of. You spoke then as a secondary person 
based on your doodle story. Now that, to me, seems reasonably contradictory considering you're actually now living (laughs) the reality of this person that you see as a secondary person. So with that in mind, is you and Mr. Doodle one and the same, or is this a fictional character that you're in the matrix of? Well, I am, uh, I am Sam Cox. Um, of course you are. And, uh, um, and sort of, that's who I've always been, and I created Mr. Doodle, um, but I am also, you know, I'm an artist working under the name of Mr. Doodle, mm. but Mr. Doodle has his own um, mythology and sort of uh, story about, like, who he is, where he comes from, what he has to do, and his friends and his enemies and stuff. And um, following on from doing this house, I think people will start to see the world of Mr. Doodle as I go on in the future. Um, So I kind of, yeah, it's a bit of both. The lines get blurred sometimes. Does the story, has the story got an ending as you see it? Or are you still waiting? Tell me the story. (laughs) Tell Um, me the Mr. Doodle story. (laughs) Okay, so um, uh, Mr. Doodle... uh, like is born along with his evil twin brother Maz um, and uh, when he's born he likes to doodle all the time the doctors find that he has obsessive compulsive doodle disorder and uh, he, he's just involved in doodling so much so that he, he's just uh, um, doodling over everything he's got doodling over his um, his bedroom his house and his parents house and then his town and then the city and then the entire world gets covered in doodles um, and the anti-doodle squad which is a group that forms to try and destroy all these doodles and clean the earth um, build an eraser laser and they make a deal with Mr. Doodle to say um, we'll give you a rocket ship to fly away, away to the paper galaxy where you can doodle more and we'll clean the earth of these doodles so he does that and they clean the earth of doodles he flies away to the paper galaxy and that's where he builds doodle land which is like this um, huge galaxy full of doodles where the characters come alive and he mm. lives amongst them and stuff um, and then all this time this has been happening his evil twin brother Maz has been uh, scribbling away at, at home um, and uh, working in the in the basement in a different area of, of the earth and uh, and then he starts to make machines to doodle for him because he, he he doesn't like how his drawings look when he's scribbling and uh, his machines start to grow evil and they kind of come out of control and he makes this vortex and flies to doodle land and kicks mr doodle out because he's so angry at him for doodling over the earth he was like he didn't want him to do that so uh, mr doodle flies down towards earth crash lands on on the earth um and then has to find a way to get back to doodle land to defeat maz and free the doodle characters and then he meets mrs doodle on earth and big um, up mrs doodle by the way hold tight <laughs> yeah you know she's part of the narrative right now <laughs> a- absolutely <laughs> And uh, she uh, helps him by they make, an, they make a spaceship and she starts to colour in his doodles. And they make all these colourful doodles together and they fly away to doodle land and then they battle with Maz and then um, who knows how it ends. Wow. This, as you were explaining this story, it reminded me of a similar podcast I had with Mark Baudet talking about Baudet and how um, intrinsic the story is, how important the story is to the narrative of the designs, and although we don't um, automatically recognise it as a story, it's almost like you've got a script, a a script that's so important for you to stand by. Yeah. Because without that managerial, you know, document, you don't create in the same way, do you? Yeah, totally, yeah. I'd like to think I try and um, fit almost everything that I do within that storyline so that one day I can create an exhibition or show of some form and show how all these things connect in some way. Do do you see that in other people's art? Can you see a storyline hinged on, like, I mean, when we're talking about Mr. Duda, I might add, I put you up there in the top three to five higher echelon street artists. I I would put Obey up there. I'd put Banksy up there. You're definitely up there right now as the top tier. Wow, thank you. My pleasure, and any time. Do you, do you see a narrative in a lot of other artists' work of a similar calibre? Um, I think most artists look at their work and they look at each 
piece and create a narrative for that particular piece or, or they have something they want to say and convey like a political message or something they want to say about the world or something mm. but I, I'm not sure there's that many artists who sort of think about how each piece they've done throughout their life all connects as one big story mm. um, I'm sure that does happen but it's something I've seen less of Mm. Do you think the more immersive you take yourself into the story, the more the reality of the story feeds into your output? Yeah, I, I think so, yeah. I mean, now that I'm sort of, I've created this house and I'm going to live in it and stuff, I think the more time I spend in it and I'm um, sort of live amongst the doodles and look at them every day, then I'll feel more inspired and more mm. involved as Mr. Doodle and I think it will just keep going. Okay, so... You, you, I watch these, you know, motivational videos, you know, um, with, you know, the likes of Arnold Schwarzenegger or, uh, I don't know, um, you know, the kind of the the Will Rock. Smith ones, you know, the ones we're talking about yeah. here, the Kobe Bryant ones where, yeah. you know, they genuinely talk of a level of tunnel vision that almost isolates family members, loved ones, people that, you know, don't fit the model of friendship or just that you have to move on and develop and because you're so motivated and focused on that one singular thing. What does your family think? <laughs> um, uh, well, my family is, like, hugely supportive and um, I'm lucky enough to work with uh, my wife, Elena. She she works with me in our, in our company and does a lot of my um, PR and social media stuff and things. Mm and ideas generator and stuff. And I also work with my dad, who's my manager. Big up pops. Yeah. Old type pops. And my granddad, my, my papa. Oh, um, hold on, double uh, pops. <laughs> All in the hat. Gee, so you've got everybody. Yeah. Okay, okay. How, so, did, how did this come? How did you, <laughs> what did you feed them? How did they, <laughs> how did they get to that point um, where it all suddenly makes sense to them that you're, you're thinking this way and they adapt to that? How well, um, I mean, my granddad has been the one I've probably worked with for longest and he's always been, like, he prepares my canvases. So if I need to work on, like, a red canvas, then he'll paint it red for me and then I'll draw a character on it and stuff. And, um, and we've been doing that for years now in the studio and he's also helped me with my online shop and he helps me take stuff up to the post office and things like that. Um, and, uh, and then later on, like, I had different managers over my course of my uh, life really and it has never really worked that well with any of them mm. and my parents have always seen that happen and then my dad just offered to take over that that work mm. and um d do that for me now that he's sort of uh, he's kind of like got to a point where there's his other business where he can step away from it and have more time to help me and stuff um and then yeah so everyone's sort of slowly it's slowly become uh, a, like a small team of people mm. and then we got my um, old uh, graphics teacher Morgan from school and uh, I asked him to come and join the team as well and be my creative director wow. and we've got a really nice like small small team of us just uh, yeah working like a little little family of uh, yeah. everyone wants to see the, the doodles succeed and stuff and it's really a good sort of working environment yeah I can only imagine the the energy that comes in to the family when actually there's a, it's almost like a focus, it's like, you know, it's like a, it's like a, f a, f a fire in the living room. It's like, yeah. it's, it's this thing that you can almost lean on for, for a level of, wow, this is, you can feel the energy of it, it's working. Yeah. It's and it's, yeah. I think it's great because like sometimes, um, I think it's, some people say you shouldn't really work with family because it can be complicated and stuff. And um, we haven't really found that there's been any issues with it. And I've always thought that, like, if there's something that um, I need to be done that I can't do myself or something, then um, it's best to try and get family to, to do that mm -hmm. if possible because they'll always try and do a good job for you and stuff. And, and when, I first did, when I first started working on the house, I had to change it from what it was to a blank white canvas. Mm -hmm. And... Um, I got my uncle Graham to come around and just have a look at the place and originally he was just going to do some work in the kitchen but mm. he said he could do all of it and you know change all of it and and work on it for me and um, he did like such a good job and yeah, we still work it. with him now um, <laughs> on stuff so he's yeah. swanked all right okay so the house we'll get into some other finer details uh, about the inner workings of Mr Doodle but the exterior and the way in which uh, this 
uh, your mind plays out on wall, on every single surface, from every single uh, corner of the eye. Um, how did you, how did you end up purchasing this place, and validate it? Uh, maybe not so much to your family, but just to, to to be given to buy, to own a place, and say, well, actually, I'm just going to do what no one's ever done before, and I'm going to knock it out with just this illustration. Yeah. How did you? How was that? How was that? conveyed to the people that you were buying the, the house off of? How was that conveyed to, to everybody that <laughs> may have turned around, the naysayers, shall we say? Yeah. How, did, how, how, did, how was this proposition forged? Well, I mean, uh, like, I, I told, like, family and friends about this idea, like, a, f- a few years before, like, before it really got serious and stuff, and I, I was, starting, like, saving money and looking at houses and stuff, and I was looking at, like, smaller houses and houses where it would have been much more problematic to draw on because, like, I was looking at ones where the neighbours are right, you know, like, touching the house, like, it's like a terraced yeah. house or something like that, um, and that would have been really sort of tricky to do, and I was showing pictures of these houses to my family and friends, and they were going, like, oh, you know, Sam, you really can't, like, do a house, you really shouldn't shouldn't do it because people are going to get like uh, they're going to complain about it and stuff you know so I had to find one that was like situated in its sort of own sitting where no one could really get too Mm. annoyed with how it looked and stuff this is is Um, what they call a high class problem (laughs) it's got to be a mansion I just know it (laughs) let's call let's call the investors in now (laughs) yeah but I mean uh, I mean I didn't think I'd ever be able to um, afford something like this but I just kept doing exhibitions and working on like pieces and stuff and saving all the money I was making, I was just saving and put it, putting it towards the house and stuff. And um, fortunately, just like in the sort of years of 2018 and 2019, I worked hard enough to um, and put my work in the right places and I did the right sort of things to generate enough income to be able to um, afford this this place. And it was just a perfect perfect place to, to get and um yeah like I didn't think I'd be able to do it but it managed to manage to happen everything just fell into place and stuff so it was mm. this is a, this is a modern a creative story of how you especially in the creative world of how you go about in this modern age of creating attention for yourself to the point that you get you actually get what you want um f- People will be very familiar with your work who check out this podcast, not only for the podcast before, but your work rate during 20, between, at least between 2016 and 2019 just escalated. And you were, I, you were going as ham on socials as you were in real life in exhibitions. There was a virality to it, which we did joke prior to recording that... <laughs> This is almost like one big virus in a house, you know. Yeah. You, and you, your attention to that, it goes to show that you really embodied the social media viral aspect of what you were doing. To here's a level of therapy when you see you doing what you do on a, on a canvas, that taking it to those emotional states and then bringing it out here, it begs the question of like how, how did you put on that mindset? How did you take hold of what was in our, arguably limited in your creative output, but take it to such a massive level? Sure. How did you do that? Um, well, I just got taught when I was young that um, someone said to me, I think it was a teacher or, or someone said, um, only 5% of students who study art or illustration or something like that um, actually go on to be successful artists and are able to live off the money they make from their work. And hearing that, I just thought that statistic's so small that I've just got to give everything I can to um, my work and work as much as possible, like draw for 15, 16 hours a day and just enjoy it and draw the things that make me happy and just do it as much as I physically can um, to to make it work. Mm. Because I didn't want to get to like be sort of older in my life and and look back 
and think, oh, you know, I could have tried a bit mm. harder in these years. I spent too much time, I don't know, watching TV in those years or, or something mm-hmm. like that. And, and I really wanted to just, t- like, just sort of direct all my energy towards this. And, mm. um, and I just gave it every, everything I could, and I still do that now. And, um, but, like, to make, to make it work, I, I just had to, to, to do as much as I could, really. But a lot of people, right, so give it everything you've got. So there's graffiti writers out there right now that I'm sure are out there painting, bombing, tagging, doing everything that they can to get their name up. And in equal measure, there's probably some arts and craft colleges right now that have students that want to hit the grade. You merge both. You take the work rate of one and you the knowledge of the other. And then I know there's people out there that feel that they're doing as much as they can. Yeah. What did you do to break through the resistance that may have been in any other person's mind or going down the wrong track and levelling up and saying, no, I'm going down this track? There's a level of discipline there. Was there any other moment where you're just like, no, this is, this is the mindset you need to have? Is it, was there a switch where you're just like, no, it's got to be like this to excel more than anyone else would? What you mean as in like how I sort of show my work and how yeah, I... Uh, yeah, uh, um, I think, um, yeah, I think uh, when I first dressed in doodle clothes, that was a big turning point. Mm-hmm. And I was working a lot up till then and not that many people were paying attention and stuff. And then when I d- dressed in the doodle outfit, I got a big reaction from the people in my class at university. And uh, I just thought, oh, I can't, I shouldn't take this off anymore. You mm-hmm. know, I should be wearing this all the time because like that's going to bring attention to my work. And um, you've got to be a bit of like an attention seeker in a way to to get people to see what you're doing. And um, you've got to really do something you believe in because otherwise people don't really have any reason to believe in it in yeah. themselves you know yeah. um and i don't know it's just uh just been a process of for like many years now just of of working like really hard and but also trying to do things uh, like thinking about things in a clever way mm. um documenting like i try and make sure i document a lot of what i do because i feel like the 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 video aspect of uh, and the f- f- photos of of what i do is is equally as interesting as the final piece, you know. Mm. People like to see the process of a drawing being made and um, like time lapses and stuff like yeah. that. Um, and just being aware of what works on social media, what what trends are in and stuff like that. And um, trying to not completely shape your work around that way, but just being aware of those things and, um, and making what you do fit somehow to, to the world that we Culturally. live in. Yeah. Um. You've got some hardcore fans for that reason. They just completely embrace every single step that you take. What what was it like, quote unquote, coming out with the gear at the <laughs> age you were, and um, having peer groups and you know, genre defining attitudes and stuff? Like, did you yeah. ever get any stick? I mean, do you, do you yeah. get? You must have done. Yeah, I mean, I was, I was like. When I when I went into university like this, it was one thing. But when I went out onto like out in the you know, out into Bristol where mm. I was studying, just in the street and stuff, um, wearing this, like I was so like I felt so so much, felt so embarrassed, you know, like really? underneath it all, you know. But I I loved like what I'd made and stuff, and I thought it was like different and interesting, and I really wanted to see how the world reacted to it. But I was I'm quite like a shy person really, and I just and I back then especially and like I I just didn't know what people were going to think and I was just walking around in it and but people get like were sort of people were looking and even though they might not have liked it they were interested in it that's incredible so you were embarrassed for it you were embarrassed for yourself but yet something it's a lot of fucking bravery dude like I'm no this is it (laughs) I've because that's where most people fail is when they look at themselves too closely in the mirror and start second guessing. Isn't it? Yeah, yeah. But I think you just like if you see an opportunity and you, as any part of you that thinks, oh, that might work, that might be good for me, then I think you just got to try and go for it. Yeah. Especially when you're young and like, like you don't maybe don't have like kids or a wife or something like or a partner or anything, and then you've you've got everything you around you you've got all this time and 
um, availability to give everything you can to your to your work, then you might may as well just like try it and try mm-hmm. out these different things. And if they go wrong, like it doesn't matter because you you know you you, you gave it a, a gave it a go, and that's better than second like guess, guessing it in the future and looking back and thinking maybe I should have done that. Mm. Very much so. Well, okay. Well, let's get into some relationship talk now. <laughs> Mrs. Doodle. Yeah. You coined it there. They got to fit in. It's got to work. Right. She's got to be understanding. She'll be patient. <laughs> Mrs. Doodle definitely is in the building. How much? How much does she have to tolerate? And how much have you got to kind of water down your day to days? Because, like you're saying, this is your this is your life. Yeah. This is something that you created before Mrs. Doodle, but she's part of the story and, and an even bigger one in, in personal lifestyles and and you know two together make a team. Yeah. Uh, how much does she tolerate? How much do, do you do? And how much have you watered down? How much of that is factored um. in? But, uh, I mean, I haven't had to, like, water down anything in terms of, like, um, what, I, what I do, like, who I present, what I present to the world, like, as a character of Mr. Doodle or anything like that, because Elena's really sort of supportive of everything I do. Um, and, like, I haven't really, there's not really been any ideas where she's sort of thought, oh, maybe, you know, don't do that or anything. Um, she's always been totally, like, behind everything. Um, I guess, like, I probably draw a bit less than I used to now that I'm with Elena because um, there's times where we have, you know, we'd go for a, to walk the dog um, for like an hour or something. Mm. So, and I, I used to just be spending every hour when I was awake doodling. Mm. So um, there's a little bit less like that, but she's really, she encourages me to draw and she, you know, she tells me like, you should draw this, like go and try that. And just like tells me to go to the studio and like try something different today. And it's good to have that other voice mm. like in, in, in my life, like because I, um, there wasn't that many people I would sort of bat ideas off, you know, and she's sort of, great because Elena always like we have conversations about stuff and it's funny because often like I'll be going to sleep at night and um we're both about to fall asleep and then I'll just go what do you think about this like I've just had this idea and like suddenly we're up I love that you do that I love that you do that that's amazing (laughs) yeah so can I just put into context because for anybody that is just like surfacing in here and dialing into the realities of where we are right now we are in doodle mansions here and for anybody that for anybody that's coming in here it's a complete eye opener let alone if it's your missus you know what I mean um does it ever get too much for you does it ever get like do you get anxiety or a headache or you know do you, does she ever <laughs> say anything to you like oh like this is a what have you done <laughs> do you ever get any of those moments um no it's not it's always sort of the opposite of that really I mean in terms of actually like doing the drawings um the more i draw each day the happier i feel when i go to sleep at the end of the day yeah like i feel like oh that was a good productive day Mm. whereas if i haven't drawn enough then i feel like oh you know i should be doing maybe just five minutes before i go to sleep or something Mm. i feel a bit uh, uneasy um really yeah does it does it take you to a kind of spiritual place being in here right now does it feel quite um mosaic does it feel like i'm i'm in my central place yeah, it feels like it's sort of my happy place because we're within, like, my favourite piece of art that I've ever made. Mm. Um, yeah, yeah, <laughs> see? Real talk. Yeah, uh. yeah, and it just, yeah, feels good. Um, feel relaxed and uh, feel like I can just be myself within this place. But But knowing you for the period I have and having had the podcast which is obviously more of a deeper conversation than I'd normally get a chance to with some of my more closer friends Um, your repetition and habitual need for moving on does it feel like sometimes you could be sitting here looking up at the wall and saying I need to redo this whole place again because (laughs) I'm used to all of this now do you ever get that feeling? Um, no, because I just feel like that would be that would be a shame to use my time to go over something that I've already drawn on, whereas I can try and find somewhere else to, to draw, you know. If I have a new idea for this room, then I'd I'd rather find another room that exists outside this house and do that there mm. rather than change this one because we don't have that long in our lives to create 
um, art and do whatever we do. And, you know, it'd be, be kind of like not, wouldn't be great if I was just painting over the same wall and redoing it all the mm. time, I think. Who are your influences? Like, where, where does this influence for such grand, you know, grand artistic productions come from? Um, well, in terms of the scale of what I'm doing, I feel like Walt Disney's a big influence because I feel like he had these ideas and this sort of language of visuals and he uh, extended it and blew it up into entire theme parks mm. and uh, films and just a huge brand and like this really iconic, well-known well worldwide thing that's just a really big thing. And that's why I like to think in big in terms of, mm. you know, let's do more than just a room and do it through our whole house and mm. stuff. But sort of stylistically and stuff, I've, I'm influenced by sort of um, Keith Haring and mm. Jean Dubuffet um, mm -hmm. and graffiti artists, street artists and pop artists. Uh, yeah, lots of different people, really. Mm. I guess with this modern age of technology and the way things are going and the way that you've utilised it, um, I, I just I remember when you first came out and there was just... There was no rules. There was no stone unturned. The, the, the idea that you could doodle on absolutely anything and make it your business too was, was actually refreshing. It was almost like it, the, the, it was a graffiti extension, but of course there was the street art thing as well. And you've kind of carved a lane which you're neither either or now. Right. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, and again, I'm not sure how much was that how much of that was forecast sure. or by accident, but you were certainly making those moves that was tr trying to push away from the status quo. Sure. Well, I feel like, um, yeah, like uh, when I was younger, like street artists and graffiti artists was, they were the people I looked up to and I wanted to be like them. Um, but you worked a, with Insta and people like that, am I right? You worked with a couple of different graffiti writers. I worked writers with uh, Jiver and Ventzer. and um, Big up them, man, yep, yeah, 100%. Tizer and stuff. Big up Tizer, yeah. yeah. Um, and, uh, like, and some people like those guys like who I met, like they were really sort of friendly and um, like loved working with them and stuff. But a, a lot of people were sort of on, online and uh, other platforms and things who are graffiti writers and, and street artists really don't like what I do. And I felt like less of a, less like I was sort of one of them, I guess. Where did that come from? Where, where, where do you think that I think it's like, comes from? I think it's because um, whilst I go out and spray walls and things like that, um, I'm wearing this doodle outfit and I'm sort of presenting myself as like this character with this kind of made up story and mm. stuff. And that's not really traditional in the graffiti world I guess it's sort of like um I, I think maybe they just don't don't like that sort of thing you know it's a bit like um mm. making it more somehow more accessible to the mainstream possibly through doing that I think because do doodling is something that's like accessible to mm. everyone because everyone does a bit of doodling and stuff um when they're on the phone or whatever and um it's something that everyone can get to grips with but maybe some people don't don't like that i mean I, I i i do believe that it's important to i mean musicians have been doing it forever slash wouldn't be slash if he didn't have his top hat sure do you know what i mean yeah, yeah. that's part of the and i don't think it's forced it's just yeah and i i i know you un, you understand it to be uncomfortable when you're wearing your outfit but as a not position, anymore yeah, but as yeah. a position of identity though yeah. it's about having ownership of your of your creative art and design right yeah yeah I, I, I mean i don't get me wrong like there is obviously there's a lot of people from that world that do um sort of like what i do and yeah, stuff 100%. and are supportive and stuff yeah yeah yeah. but talking to a bunch of people about i was going to come around here and they were just like they lost their shit i think perceptively as time goes on you know what i mean ideas yeah. mature as do the artists and i think there's a space for that. Like I said, you carved your lane. There's plenty of people out there that have got nothing but high regard for what you're, you're doing. Yeah, that's cool, yeah. It's a beautiful thing. Yeah. And I think the more, <laughs> the more you delve deeper into this, the, the harder it is for people to in any way critique. It's so important to, to 
take what you do to the limit. Or should, like you've said, you'll be there thinking forever, oh, I wish I'd done that. Yeah. yeah. The whole attitude can be sometimes a little bit backward, in my, my you, opinion. Yeah. Yeah, you know I mean. <laughs> um, you said that you were going to take this thing to the limit, to another world, to another worldly place. Now you've had your clothing design, you've got your houses, you've got stuff in different countries that you've been selling and uh, monetizing on to be able to create and have this amazing place. Talk to me about, because I'm, I'm going go to go with Asia straight away, because okay. this is like Beatles mania when you go out there, bro. Like, <laughs> right. what's the deal? Like, they, <laughs> they literally flock to come and see you. Um, yeah, it's not, it's not that... It's not that crazy, but it, it is. That's not what the social media suggests, <laughs> my friend. Like, like, and you pull in some money from this this thing that you've created. And I'm not saying it's singularly Asia, but yeah, you're doing good in other countries. Yeah, um, yeah, it's really cool to see, like, to to go to a, the other part, the other side of the world, to a place you haven't been before, like the first times I went out there, and see people who I've never met, like, come up to me and be like, hi, you're Mr. Doodle, and come and get a photo and stuff. And, mm. and like, I do a little drawing for them. And, um, and yeah, it's, it's, like, it's amazing to, to, to see my work be, like, so well received by people from, like, another country, like, far away and stuff. It's mm. really cool. Um, and, yeah, it's been going well, like, over there. And uh, I've really enjoyed all the projects I've been doing over there. I haven't been able to travel over there um, for quite a while now because there was COVID and then there was just then I was working on the house and stuff. Mm. Um, and uh, but we I'm looking forward to going there in the future because it'd be nice to take go there with Elena mm. and show her because she's never been to um, sort of Japan or Korea or Hong Kong or anything. Dude, isn't so. that the perks of the job? Bringing someone along that you care about and. Yeah. What's, yeah. what's been the most eye-opening thing that you've ever come across in your journey thus far? What is the most, like, wow moment um, being Mr. Doodle? God, I, I really don't know. Um, have you had, like, have you... Okay, for example, not that I imagine it would happen, but you were doing an art exhibition and all of a sudden you got a nudist that ran across with a billboard <laughs> saying love Mr. Doodle or some <laughs> random shit like that. Um, no. Anything crazy that's happened like that before? No, I don't think, no, I don't think anything like that's happened. Um, well, here's a surprise. Here it comes. <laughs> I'm joking. <laughs> I'm fucking with you. I'm fucking with you. You're going to do world domination. It's going to happen, isn't it? I hope so, yeah. Are well, you still I've... sketching? Because if you check out the other podcast, you're... King Sketcher on your phone. You've got like all the dongles and everything to be sketching on your phone all the time. You still do that? Yeah, yeah. I, I've I've done over two hundred forty thousand uh, phone doodles now. I'm trying to get to a million, but that's taken a long time to Cook get there. A fucking cat, mate. The, 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 and, and they all stored. Yeah. Does do they ever repeat themselves? No. Uh, well, I mean, they might look slightly similar to each other, but they're never exactly the same because I have a program that goes through them and identifies if any of them are the same in case I've exported the same one twice. Get the get out of here, really? Yeah. <laughs> so this is your mind, this is like virtual, this is mind mapping. You've got everything that you, you're constantly checking and identifying if they're individual or not. Yeah, well, not, I just, it's not, I don't do that all the time, but I put them onto the computer and I run the program maybe every couple of months or so. Why do you do and that for? because I'm trying to get to a million. So I'm trying to, like, I'm storing them all in a folder, and when I get to a million, I want to print them all and do an exhibition of, like, a million doodles. A million doodles. Yeah. All individual and different. Yeah. <laughs> I'm lost for words. <laughs> uh, and is that part of the bigger camp? Because you also said that you want to take on villages. You want to take on other houses. Yeah. That it's viral now. You're, you want to take it to that. Yeah, totally. Well, my dream is to... Um, extends the stop motion film that I was showing you earlier. Yeah. Um, so I want to see that finish and then and then a new one is created that links directly from that first one so that eventually when I'm about 75 or so, I can have these six or seven films and they can all be played in order and it makes one like 10 minute um, film that all shows how I doodle my house and a village and doodle land. Oh then man, you're, you're living in a real virtual world in real time of creating what's it going to be like are you like are you going to are you going to like doodle a church and it'll just be of your own and there'll be your 
you, you, you know, you, the, 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 the um, yeah, you'll be uh, cremated or buried and you'll have the, the, the plaque that says... Well, that'd be cool. <laughs> yeah. I'm just throwing it out there, dude. Like, I'm surprised you haven't thought about it. Yeah. Like, what, what's the, is, would that be like the penultimate end goal of Sayonara? Like, you've <laughs> yeah. created the world and the, and the church is to do... What's the one what the doodle church is going to look like? Yeah, that'd be pretty cool. The stained glass doodles. That'd be nice. <gasps> <laughs> what? That would be incredible. Yeah. Who'd be who'd be the choir? Would they all be in doodle outfit, do you think? Yeah, I reckon so. Yeah. Yeah, yeah some sort of doodled choir. Yeah, but think about the legacy that you're leaving with the world right now. It's bonkers to think how how many twists and turns you're about to go. And I said this on the last podcast. I I genuinely feel that this this is like almost like a recap. It's like, okay, so you know, four years on, five years on, eh, doing this. Look yeah. what's happened. Can you imagine in 20 years from now, 30 years, all these different areas in which you're accomplishing to greater, higher heights? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it'll be, it'll be re- it will be really interesting, like, to sort of, you know, see you in another four years' time and see what's happening. Crazy. <gasps> we'll have doodle sweets. Yeah. You know, there'll be Murray mints, but doodle, doodle mints. Yeah. And each one will have a different thing. Absolutely. I mean, if, if you're not watching and listening, there are doodle biscuits and doodle fruit on the table here. Uh, I am <laughs> not bullshitting you. This is some surreal, surreal stuff. Favourite uh, space in the room before we sign off? Favourite space in the room? In this room? In, or, every, in any oh, room, yeah. Favourite um, favorite space. I like the hallway as you come in. Yeah, yeah two of every animal. That's my favourite bit, I think, with the staircase and stuff. It's so impactful, isn't it? Thank you. It really is. Um, and I said it when I came in, there's nothing about this that is unusual to me and I don't know, I don't know whether I should be fr- worried about that or be totally at peace <laughs> with it, but I feel like we're in your world. Yeah, absolutely. Well, welcome to my world. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, you're going to move in here? This is going to be your home base? Yeah, um, that's the plan, to, to live, in, live in the doodle land, yeah. God, I love that. Sam? You're an absolute genius. Thank you so much for letting us start. Thanks so much, man. (laughs) Ladies and gentlemen, Killer Keller Podcast, Outlet In Was Out of Fashion, Mr. Doodle HQ, and the future's only brighter, it's only going to get better, and it's only going to get more doodly. Um, You've been warned. Sharing is caring. Don't forget, crime don't pay, but neither do they. (laughs) Paying here, obviously. Um, We Outlet In Was Out of Fashion. You stay lucky, people. Don't talk to anyone. I wouldn't. Nice one, Sam. Peace. (laughs) (laughs) 